Floor is yours, sir. All right, appreciate you, Coach, man. I appreciate everyone coming and, and spending some time this morning to talk about DB play uh, and defense in general. You know, I think the uniqueness uh, of the situation we're in right now with this quarantine is people have never been so available to share ideas. And I know I've benefited tremendously the last couple of weeks being able to get on Zoom and listen to a lot of great coaches uh, share ideas. So really excited to be able to do that for you guys. I got my contact information up here. You know, uh, like I said, now is better than ever to kind of connect and, and get questions answered. And I love love talking football. So if any question comes up as we go through this, please let me know. Uh, like Coach said, I'm the safeties coach, defensive coordinator at the University of Louisiana, uh, Raging Cajuns. You know, really fortunate to, to work for probably, in my opinion, the best head coach in college football, Coach Napier. He's an awesome man. He's a great leader and a phenomenal football mind as well. So with that being said, you know, I used to hate all the, the recruiting intros. So let's just get right to what we're talking about today, assuming my PowerPoint is going to work for me. And there we go. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is just defensively uh, a teaching progression. And the thing, you know, the thing I talk about is we want to play defense, not defenses. So the, the foundation of this teaching progression is how you play defense. And to me, that's ta takeaways, tackling, and block destruction. Before you can do those three things, uh, you can't be effective playing any defense, all right? So, you know, I look at this pyramid. It's kind of like Wynn's pyramid of success for, for defense. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you're a psychology guy, before you can – actualize as a defensive player, you have to be able to take the ball away, tackle, and, and destruct blocks, all right? From there, you know, we have a very specific progression we like to go through with our players because we are multiple on defense, and we like to say that, that it all needs to build, uh, build on each other. So the first thing we always talk about with everybody in our defense is what's our alignment? You know, you watch a lot of film, and really I think that's why tempo is so popular. It keeps you from getting aligned in the offense's mind. So to me, defensively, the Priority number one is to get the proper alignment. All right, we'll talk about that more in a second. And then once you know how to align, what's your assignment? What's your job in that specific defense? Uh, verse run and verse pass to be able to do your job. From there, once you know how to align and what your job is, your key is what gives you the tools to get your job done. All right, so for us, we talk about a primary key and a secondary key, especially everywhere in the secondary. All right, primary key basically should be your hard focus, the snap of the ball to tell you if it's run or pass. And then the secondary key is going to confirm whether it is run or pass, right? So example, maybe I'm the curl flat player, I'm keying in man. All right, I get a, a higher hat read, my eyes are going to snap to number two now. He's releasing, I, I do this, right? Uh, that's an example of that progression for us. Simple, but necessary. So the big thing we talk about is until you know how to align, what your assignment is and what your key is, Technique doesn't matter, all right? Because it doesn't matter how nice your back pedal is if you're not using it at the right time, right? Doesn't how good of a, doesn't matter how good of a pass rusher you are if you're rushing against run, all right? So you got to know how to align what your assignment is, what your key is, and then we're going to be hard in the technique aspect. And then the last part of it would be finish. Sorry, I clicked that a little early. Let me go back to that. Would be finish, right? That's the that's the, the last part of the, the whole deal is how are you going to finish the play, which goes back to the foundation. Either you're going to be with a block destruction, a tackle, a takeaway, a PBU, an interception, or unbelievable effort to the football. So that's kind of the progression we use. You know, me as a coach, if I went and interviewed for a job and someone asked me how to install cover three for all 11 defenders, I would go through it in that order. What's the alignment of everyone? What's the assignment of everyone? What are they keying and what technique are they going to use? You know, so me as a coach, I use that progression and so do our players. All right. Now from there, you know, the one thing I think that's important, especially in the secondary is to have a standard eye progression for them. All right. Cause you know, the old saying, you see a lot, you see a little, you see a little, you see a lot. We want to give them a specific eye progression to use as they go through the play. All right. So let me see here. So the first thing we talk about is scan, all right? And when we talk about scan, we're A, getting the signal from the sideline, all right? B, we want to see the down and distance. We want to see the formation of the offense as it comes out. We want to see the splits of the receivers based on our dividers. We want to see what receivers are on or off the ball. And then the et cetera would be game plan, all right? Uh, do we need to see if the back's cheated out wide to identify a free release, right? Do we need to see the back level? If he's deeper than the quarterback, it's possibly probably a run. If he's up tighter, it could be a pass, stuff like that. That's game plan specific. But we want to give our guys a checklist, especially in the secondary of 
after I get the signal, these are the things I need to look at to be able to do my job to the highest level. All right. And then after you scan the formation, keep hitting the wrong button, bear with me. All right. After you scan the formation, now we talk about zooming in to your primary key. So it's like a sniper looking through a scope, right? All we want to see is that primary key, whatever it may be, to be able to tell us, is it run past, right? And then from there, we talk about the snap. So after I saw my primary key, all right, now I want to snap my eyes to the secondary key. You know, I look, I'm always in the back as a DB coach. We have the white stripe down our helmet. We want to see that white stripe snap from where their eyes should start on the play to where their eyes should progress to in their secondary key. All right, so that's an example of the eye progression we use in the secondary to make sure that we're getting our job done appropriately. All right, now this next thing we talk about, especially in the secondary, is what are fundamentals, right? You know, I, I've, I've been in interviews and I've talked to coaches and I've said, you know, we're going to be fundamentally sound or we're going to be great at fundamentals. But then you ask the people that say that, well, what are the fundamentals of your position? Can you clearly articulate and define those and get your players to be able to understand what is truly fundamental playing defensive back? So I've kind of boiled it down into four categories with subgroups. So the first fundamental of playing effective defensive back is just your alignment. So we got three things that go into that. First thing is we want the same stance every snap. If we're playing off, it should look the same whether I'm playing an off third, off man, if I'm off going to a, a zone, whatever it may be, we want to present the same snap or same stance down in and down out to not give a tip to the offense. We all look for, you know, bird rabbit indicators from the offense. We don't want to give those same indicators to the offense, right? You know, I, classics are the post player. If you roll into the post, you have your inside foot back. But if you're playing a half, you have your outside foot back, right? We don't want to give those away. So the first fundamental is just having the same stance every snap. And then we talk about depth and we talk about leverage. Those are the two forms of alignment. You know, depth, how deep do I need to be to get my job done? And then at what leverage do I need to be? I tell my players all the time, the dictionary definition of leverage is something to gain an advantage, okay? Something to gain an advantage. So playing defensive back, if the receiver has a tight split and I have a post safety, I gain an advantage by playing outside leverage, forcing him to my help, all right? So it's fundamental that we do that. From there, wrong button again. From there, now the second fundamental we talk about is eye discipline, which I just hit on, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over this, but we talk about the primary key and secondary key. That's fundamental to get your job done. Now, the third thing where I think we're a little unique is we talk about footwork, all right? So what we do is we try and tie our primary eye discipline, the primary key into primary footwork. I think where you watch defensive backs get beat, it's on the snap because their eyes and feet aren't in sync. If your eyes and feet are in sync, that's how you start winning the rep at the bottom of the route, all right? So when we talk about we're seeing our primary key, all right, we should be using a primary footwork on the snap. So that means on the snap of the football, I should be either be scooching, inching. I should take a slam or squat step, which is coming to balance. I should be walking out, which is a smooth pedal, or I should be kick sliding, which is a mirror if you were playing press, all right? But that's what I should be doing. And then based on my leverage, I'm going to use one of those that's appropriate for the technique. So, for example, I'm playing outside leverage man. The only thing I should do on the snap is scooch. All right, that's it. You know, you watch on film, a lot of DBs, they'll lose their leverage because they step with the wrong foot on the snap. You know, they step with their inside foot. When they're outside leverage, your leverage is lost. All right, so we tie the primary footwork into the eyes, and then we tie the transition into the eyes. So once you snap to your secondary key, a transition could be happening. That could be a zero break, a 45 break, a 90 break. We talk about a 135 open. It's just the protractor of breaks, right? So opening on the post or the corner. All right, we talk about open breaks, quick turns, which are your, you know, your baseball turn in the center field, baseball turn on a route over 90 degrees if you're a corner, those sort of things. A slow turn would be a, a break under 90 degrees, having to get around my hips. Man turn and zone turn for, you know, bail corner, uh, zone defender, man defender, right? But the thing that we preach is, like, we're not going to go out there and do a footwork drill that's not realistic. So our transitions are going to be what you see in the game, and those are the transitions that you do see in the game, all right? And we're going to tie those transitions into our keys, right? So, for example, if you're playing slot man on number two, your primary key is the release of number two your primary footwork would be a scooch. As you scooch, if number two breaks, I'm going to match that break 
with the appropriate angle. So let's say it's a speed out. I'm going to match it with a 45 break. That's the transition as my eyes transition with the receiver. So that's just a little bit of a, a idea of how we set up, you know, the technique as a fundamental with the eyes. And then the, the last fundamental that we'll talk about is the finish, right? And really the finish is the most important part of the play, right? You're not beat till you're beat, finish every rep, right? So we get into the block destruction aspect. You know, at defensive back, I really emphasize three kinds of block destruction. So we talk about a tear off, we talk about a constrict and avoid, and we talk about defending cut blocks, all right? So tear off would be if the ball carrier is in close proximity and I have to engage the blocker, right? The ball carrier is directly behind them on a bubble. I have to press them with two hands and then I have to violently tear the receiver to my hip and wipe the backhand through to get off the block. A constrict and avoid happens a lot in the secondary screen. Let's say the ball carrier is out of phase. He's far behind the blocker. There's no reason for me to go butt up a guard in the open field. I'm going to constrict his space. It's like kickoff coverage. I'm going to go nose to nose, step on his toes, and then I'm going to avoid outside him. And then the last thing would be a cut. We work hard on interceptions. PBUs, we define the PBU by where the DB is on the receiver with a long arm, a rake, a chest to chest finish, or a cat. I'm going to go into detail on that at the end of this presentation. We break our tackles down by most frequent. So we have sideline tackles, we have vice tackles, uh, we have profile tackles, trap tackle, a heel clip, and a wrap and roll. Those are the ones that are most common for us in the secondary. So we name them that way and we drill them that way. And then we define our takeaways. You know, we have a stumble bum, which is where the ball carrier is going to the ground and the ball is exposed. A punch, you know, that's uh, Peanut Tillman, an alumni of UL, where they made that famous in the NFL. He caused 44 uh, turnovers in his career, and he used the punch quite a bit, punching the back third of the football, trying to dislodge it. A poke coming from behind, fit and rip, obviously second man in to the side of the ball. We want to fit and rip it away. And then circle chase is something that's common where the ball carrier is turning up. I'm trailing them from behind, and I try and make an attempt at the ball as it's exposed with a defender in front of them. But the point of this is, you know, that's a lot of stuff that we could you know, spend hours talking about. But the point is, I think you need to clearly define whatever the fundamentals of playing defensive back are to you and your defense and make sure that, A, you got great ways to drill them, great ways to explain them, and make sure that the kids understand that they're fundamental, all right? So moving on, you know, what I want to talk about today, and, and this is kind of a long tape, um, so long as I can get it up, is I want to talk about slot man because I feel like it's something that we we teach very well, and I think that it's something that's kind of undercoached. You know, there's a lot of ways to do it. I think playing slot man is drastically different from playing off man at corner because the space and the route tree is different. So I kind of want to talk about that with you guys today. I'm going to go a little bit fast through this so we have time for uh, questions at the end of the session. But I'm going to kind of take you through this progression. It's very similar to our press man progression on the corner end, all right, but this is how we play slot man on the outside. So the first thing we want to get our guys to understand is what is the route tree that they're defending? You know, when we talk about slot man, the slot man I'm talking about is playing outside leverage because we have some form of post safety help. All right, so what we need to understand when we do this is when you play outside leverage man, you're not defending out, or you're not defending all routes, you're defending certain routes and reacting to others. All right, so the primary routes we need to defend in slot man are out breaking routes, and then we have to be able to react to in breaking routes. Now, to me, the whole key to playing a uh, good slot man is being slow out. All right, what you don't want to do is lose a bunch of ground on the snap. And now this receiver has the entire route tree because you're on top of him. What we try and do, and you'll see some clips of it, is we want to play tight to these receivers, all right, and basically funnel them to our help and force them to run certain routes, all right? And then the other thing that we talk about quite a bit is reading the, de the demeanor of the receiver. So, like, for us, we want to be slow out for the quick game. Well, we try and get our, our, our DBs to understand that routes occur on steps. So you go back and study every, every slant run against you, and I'd be willing to bet a lot that a majority of them, so long as it's not a glance off RPO, that's different. A slot, a slot slant typically occurs off the second outside step, all right? And then the speed out typically occurs on the roll of the third inside step. So why is that important? Well, we wanna, we're playing deny the ball defense and man-to-man, we don't want to lose a bunch of ground until 
they clear that third step. Once that third step's cleared, now we're looking at reading the release and now we're looking at intermediate routes. So now our guys understand that the next break point's not gonna occur until 10 to 12 yards. So I wanna connect on that receiver and I wanna get low hip on them to be able to transition with them on the intermediate break, all right? And then, like I said, the, the routes, we're really big on defending an outside leverage man are outbreakers, all right? Because we should have forms of inside help with a majority of what we do. Like I said, I'm not talking about zero man right here. I'm talking about post safety man, all right? So the first thing we do is get the guys to understand the route tree that they're getting ready to defend. Now, the first progression in playing slot man is impeding the receiver's release, all right? Impede. So that means to stop, right? To get in the way of, right? So how do we do that? We do that by staying big square and in front of the receiver by either playing catch technique or what we call a man scooch, all right? The definition to me of a man scooch is outside foot up, inside foot back, and we're losing ground grudgingly. That means we are not backpedaling. We are losing ground grudgingly. We're slow through that three-step move area, all right? Knowing that we want to drive three-step rhythm routes and then we want to catch intermediate routes. So the worst thing I can do is lose a bunch of grounds and be at the intermediate break point. So we impede the release by staying big square and in front. And then we, the big thing we talk about is we want to make the receiver get off the line. We're going to play chicken with them, all right? So this is the example I like to use for, for that, right? At some point, someone has to move on the stem. If this is the receiver and this is the DB, if he releases vertical and I stay big square and in front of him, somebody's going to have to move it better be him and not me. I'm playing chicken with him. And where we really want him to avoid is we want him to avoid inside to our post help. That does our job for us. And if he does go outside, he has to avoid so wide that we've moved him off his vertical stem. We're not opening the gate. We've disrupted the timing of the route, if, everyone, if everyone's with me on that. So at some point, someone has to move. It better be the receiver and not the DB, all right? So here's a little bit of how we work that. Hopefully this film's not too choppy on us. All right, so this is just an example of scooch footwork. This is my first year here at UL when we're just teaching the, the, the footwork of it. So scooch, you know, I'm saying I'm the ball. So these guys have, should have their right foot up. These guys should have their left foot up. All right, and we're going to lose ground grudgingly. I think this guy probably does it the best in this example. We're going to lose ground grudgingly. It's just a step and replace. Now, the whole point of the scooch is if you're playing outside leverage, you're doing it to defend outbreaking routes. So if the receiver were to break out, the inside foot's the plant foot. If you maintain a scooch, then your plant foot's already back to plant and drive, right? That's the whole point of staying in a scooch is to be one step ahead of the receiver in the break. So we're working scooch every time I command them right here, they're taking a scooch step and then going from there, all right? Now from there, we'll work scooch breaks. This is when I was at UTSA. Just happened to be the, the film I had downloaded. Um, but now we'll work scooch breaks. So here's the example of the plant foot being back. And I know it's a little choppy. Uh, it just kind of is what it is. We'll try and do our best, right? But you can see 25 is scooching. He's keeping his plant foot consistent. I'm the out. So his plant foot's already back to plant and drive the outbreak, right? And like I said, we're losing ground grudgingly, staying square shouldered, big square and in front of the vertical stem. There he rolls out on the third inside step. We plant and drive a 45 break. All right, we'll work this under the chute to maintain good pad, pad level. All right, so here we are again, 36 on the left does a really good job in the scooch. He's losing ground grudgingly. Now, keep in mind, we would never be in the scooch this long, right? This is a short time period we're in a scooch. It's just for three-step rhythm, but we're working the footwork. We're working the square pads, the pad level, and then we're working the plant drive to my plant foot being the right foot for number 36 right here. He's able to apply pressure and drive out. I right? match the angle with his eyes. So that's another way we'll work the scooch. Now moving on, you also have to work, what if they break away from my left? So now my, my plant foot is my left foot. I gotta be able to drop it and plant drive on the slant, all right? So here you can see us doing that. Scooch, plant drive with the left foot, 45 break. All right, and Coach G, let me know if this is getting too choppy or anything like that. You're good, Coach. Um, all right, now here's a couple game examples uh, of, you know, staying big square and in front. Now, two things we talk about right here. The closer the number two receiver is to the post safety, the less you should lose ground. The worst thing you could do is scooch and now still give them an outside break away from your help, right? 
So you'll see this guy right here, he's going to play straight catch, right? He's not going to lose any ground because of how close number two is to his post safety. Now this gets back to primary footwork. When we're outside leverage and we want to continue to stay outside leverage and flat foot it, we call this a squat step. You're going to see him drop his leverage foot. He's going to come to balance with that outside foot and he's going to keep his feet hot real good. All right. And then from there, he's working the kick slide. All right. So after we scooch or if we don't ever scooch, we want to work to kick slide. We want to step and replace, keep him on our inside shoulder and stay big square and in front of the receiver. All right. We're funneling him to our post safety right there. Now we're going to talk about positioning and where we want to be on these routes here in a second. All we're looking at is the bottom portion, getting him off his stem. All right. And impeding his release. Here's another example of it. I think we're going to be up here at our nickel. All right. He's playing outside leverage as well. All right. I think he's going to catch this as well. He does right now. Look at him. He's coming to balance with that outside foot. He's using his squat step and he's using straight kick slide footwork. He's able to step and replace, keep a set of cleats in the ground. And again, he's playing what? He's playing chicken. At some point, somebody's going to have to move. It better be the receiver and it better be towards our post safety if we're playing good man-to-man -man using our leverage. You can see the other safety up top doing the exact same thing as far as funneling the slot receiver, playing catch to our inside post safety. All right, a couple good looks of it right there. Moving on. Okay, now here it is on three-step rhythm, all right? We're going to look at our, our safety over number three right here. All right, we're slightly deeper than number two to play on different levels. He's playing catch as well because of his depth. All right, and we want to sit on quick rhythm routes. So now we can play deny the ball defense on short yardage. All right, like I said, I got a lot of clips. I may buzz through some of these. Here's an example of a scooch, and then we're breaking the slant. So the plant foot's opposite. This is the drill you just saw us do on air, right, where we had the 45 break back inside away from our, our plant foot. So he's going to work his scooch, right? We're frozen a little bit. I, I got it. Here we go. We're going to work our scooch to our plant drive right there and get the ball out. All right. So there's a couple examples of it on the slant. All right. So the biggest thing we got to understand is if we do play scooch, we're scooching for the vertical stem. All right. Once he stems me horizontally, it goes right to catch. I'm working my kick slide like we saw in the two previous clips, and we're working to collision the route. Got a question here, Coach. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, do you play corners over in man? Uh, we play corners over in man and zone, so it looks the same. But, yes, sir, we do. And the corner over would use this exact same technique on the number two receiver. Is that the question? Yes, sir. All right, so now here we're talking about the vertical stem aspect of it. So, like I just said, I'm going to draw it here on the screen. All right, if I'm the DB and this is the receiver, we're scooching for a vertical stem. All right, once he stems me inside or out, I'm going to transition that scooch into a catch, all right? What we don't want to do is weave and continue to lose ground to where he can break his route in front of me, right? Because now me and the post defender are doing the same job. So immediately on that first level stem of the receiver, we're going to work the catch, all right? So right here, we just do old school mirror drill like you would with the press corner, all right? And we do it with the bag behind us because now we're saying we have a cliff mentality. I'm not losing any ground anymore, right? It's like the movie 300 we're on there, when they're on that cliff and they're holding, all right? So that's the first part of it. Second part, we would scooch, all right, to a catch. So you can see it right here. Here's a good look. If you look at 38 on the left, he's scooching on the vertical stem. Immediately when the receiver begins to stem inside or out, he's going to transition this into a catch and a kick slide, staying big square and in front and eventually giving him the hard shoulder. The hard shoulder is the inside shoulder staying square, collisioning the route. We don't want to open the hip, open the gate, and give them a free release, all right? We want to contest these routes inside knowing our help is inside, all right? Here's another example of that drill, all right? So that leads us into phase two of playing good slot man. So phase one was impede the release, right? Stay big square and in front. Phase two, disrupt the timing of the route by taking a charge, right? It's like basketball, slide your feet, stay in front of the guy dribbling the ball. We wanna stop the receiver's momentum. This is what you guys gotta understand. Stop the receiver's momentum to gain yours, right? If you open the gate, you let the receiver's momentum continue and you do nothing to gain your own momentum. 
All right, so we talk about disrupting the timing of the route by taking a charge, right? We want to stay big square in front, make them run through us, okay? Now from there, from there, from there, we're going to work this drill. All right, so we're going to work that same mirror drill, but now it's two goes. Now, you can see the setup of the drill. We still have the bag behind us, all right? We got two cones to tell the receiver where to release. We want this to be a tight vertical stem right here, all right? Tight vertical stem, all right? And we're gonna stay big square in front, second go, we're gonna collision the route, collision the route. So right here, first go, they're mirroring. Second go, you see 23 do a really good job, stay big square in front, make him release inside of them and give him the hard shoulder. The only thing, this is why we work it under the shoots, is we wanna keep our pads down as well. You're gonna see some clips of this you're going you're gonna to see some clips of this uh, here in a second, all right? You're going to hear some, see some clips of this here in a second. Yes, sir. Hold on a second. I lost, uh, losing control of my screen right here. All right, here we go. All right, so here's here's an example of it. All right, so we're gonna stay big square and in front. Here would be like a boundary safety rotating down on number two. He's gonna scooch. You wanna maintain your leverage in that scooch. All right, and then you're gonna work to catch. All right, we wanna catch that outbreaking route, disrupt the timing of the route. All right, a couple more game examples. The game examples are better, right? So I think both these guys are gonna do a pretty good job. If you look at the field nickel and the boundary safety, all right, they're gonna do a good job, stay big square and in front. The nickel's doing a pretty good job. He's catching it, right? Stop the receiver's momentum to gain yours, all right, and funnel them to the post safety. You can see both of these guys, when I pause this clip, have funneled both seams inside the seam to this post safety. Now, the post safety's already made his break based on the quarterback's to, uh, intentions to the outside receiver, but this is the look we want to get in slot man. Funnel these guys inside the hashes to make the post safety's break easier, right? We talk about the post safety having to cover 17 and a third yards, right? The distance for us in, in the college hash, these are 13 and a third. We expect our post safety to be able to get two yards outside of either hash, and those are our seams, right, which becomes 17 and a third. The further these guys can funnel these seams inside, the better off we are. All right, you're going to take another look at disrupting the timing of the route by the free safety rotating down right here. He's doing a good job. He's doing a good job showing a two shell. All right, until we get the quarterback's intentions, he's going to make the receiver run through him. That's disrupting the timing of the route playing slot man. The receiver may want it. They're running a bench route. Good call versus man to man. We disrupt the timing with the free safety. Got a question here, coach. All right. Is quick slant ever a concern due to outside leverage of the DB, or is it just something you coach against? Yeah, it is a concern. So that's why it's so important that you kind of, number one, you have dividers, all right? So we'll give these guys a divider based on what kind of man it is. So we call man different. If there's a low hole player, they know they can play outside leverage longer, like one rat or, you know, even if you play like rip, Liz, cover three, it's kind of the same principle, right? Because the, the overhang has two up and out. Now, if we ever have a, a five-man pressure where there's no low hole dropper, now we have to make sure if number two has a split wide enough to threaten us on a slant, we can play him inside leverage, all right? So definitely is a concern. That's why you got to know, or and I, do, I know you do know, but you got to make sure your kids know where their help is. And for us, we control that with the call. Certain words tell us we have low hole players, whereas certain words tell us we do not. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. Is that good right there? Yes, sir. Okay, awesome. This is kind of frozen for me. One second, let me get it going. All right, here we go. So this should be another example disrupting the timing. Look at the boundary safety, right? Number four is tight enough to the post safety. He's playing catch man, all right, which I would too. I would play catch until they can't, until they can't is really – uh, the way I look at it, a lot of people ask me, what's the best way to play man in the slot? If you think you have a lesser athlete, I think it's catch. The worst thing you can do is give a receiver a space, right? You want to suffocate the route. The last thing you want to do is have a lesser athlete have to transition. By playing catch man-to-man, -man, there is no transition. You're collisioning the route. 
and you're carrying the route, right? So good job by him. You can see him collision it, all right? It stops the receiver's momentum. It gains his momentum. He's able to track that ball all the way back across the field on the dig over whatever that was supposed to be, all right? It's a good look at our strength coach right there. All right, it's gonna be right here on number three again. So right here, just an example of putting it all together. We're playing dime and we're gonna spin one of these safeties a low hole, the other one's gonna be a high hole, which allows us to play outside leverage man. Now we're actually gonna run a five man pressure up front still and cancel it back with the rush. So you're kind of getting a lot of what you want right there. Okay, but you can see that high safety stepping down to cut, all right, which allows us to play outside leverage. Great job by our dime here on number three. All right, that's 36 from the drill tapes. You can see his stuff carrying over. All right, he's staying big square and in front. We're playing chicken right there. The only thing that would make this a perfect rep is if he maintained outside leverage. All right, but he does a great job collisioning the route. He's tight to his inside help. He disrupts the timing of the route, uses the receiver's momentum to gain his and gets back into the hip pocket here and gets a PBU, could be a pick. All right, so really good rep by him. Okay, another rep right here. Uh, if you look at the nickel to the top, this is a scooch to a catch. Now, this is a good example of a scooch, scooch to a catch. This is why you want to scooch, in my opinion, for slot fades, right? They want to go step on your toes before they make their move. You want to lose ground so they can't get your toes. Then once he makes his stem, we're going to stay big square in front. We disrupt the timing of the route right there. In my opinion, in my experience, if you can collision these slot fades, they're very rarely completed, even if they're open at the top of the route, because you disrupt the timing, and it's such a timing throw. Uh, so I think that's important, but that's a great example of, of the scooch to a catch right there. Lose ground grudgingly, big square in front, go to the catch, right? At some point, somebody's going to have to move. It's going to have to be him. Now, this is what we talked about. If he does outside release, we need to run him so wide that we affect the placement of the throw like he's doing right here. I think this is a really good example of what we've been talking about. All right, now here's another example of it. We're going to look at the nickel to the field right here. Um, good job right here. He's going to scooch. He gets a first level stem. He catches. Great job right here. All right, great job. Now we're going to talk about this here in a second, but I call this the junction point. The point at which contact's made in catch man is the junction point. This is where routes are won or lost, all right? You got to be able to feel pressure. So right here, you're going to see this guy work two to one, which is a drill we're going to work in a second. I contact him. He takes a wide outside release. I got to immediately drop my inside or my outside hand and connect with my inside hand to keep my hip open. All right, really good job by him. And now, you know, the offensive coaches I talk to, they say they want to complete this slot fade 25 yards deep top of the numbers. By doing this, we've rad that, we've rode that route to the bottom of the numbers, which affects the timing of the throw. It affects the quarterback. He's not throwing it into a bucket anymore. Yeah, coach. Got a question here. <clears throat> in regards to the contact, uh, did you say you would rather rather that happen with the shoulder? You said it seems like it would naturally be the hands. Uh, yeah, the, the aiming point we use is the inside shoulder, but we allow them to connect with their hands. Yeah, but we don't extend our hands. So you'll see a drill here that we work in a second that's really all about that hand placement, um, which I think will illustrate that. This is a good look at UT, when I was at UTSA, you know, we have a, a big nickel out there. He's really built like a Sam six foot 220 kid and he's playing catch man on, on a receiver. I think that's actually Ricky Seals Jones, the tight end that played for A&M a couple years back. All right, but doing a good job staying big square and in front and connecting on the route, disrupting the timing. That's the whole key, right? Another look at it right here playing chicken with them. Hopefully you guys can see this. Hopefully it's not too choppy, but we're playing big square and in front. At some point, somebody's going to have to move. It better be him. And we want it to go inside to the post safety, right? Really good right there. All right. So now to the point about the hands and the positioning, the third phase we talk about is positioning, right? Let me go back real quick. All right. So positioning, we talk about being, uh, well, first we impeded the release. Second, we disrupted the timing of the route. And then third, we're going to position, all right? So positioning to me means that if it's an inside release, I want to be low hip, low shoulder. 
If it's an outside release, I want to be high hip, high shoulder. All right. That's what we talk about when we talk about positioning. All right. Now, when uh, when we do position, all right, our eyes need to be down at that hip. So if I'm low hip, low shoulder, I'm seeing the low hip. If I'm high hip, high shoulder, I'm seeing the far hip. So the first drill we do, which everyone does, is just the chop stutter. So we're saying the ball's in here. All right. And we're outside leverage at DB. I'm transitioning with him. I want to be low hip, low shoulder, which is about an elbow break away. And when he sinks, I want to sink, all right? When he sinks, I want to sink. I want to stay low hip on him, right? I want to do a different job than the post safety. Now, I think this is a good look because the scout's important. He's got to give a great look, go full speed, and then stop on him. Make him stop and drop, all right? So that's the first part of position. Now, this, is, this goes to the question earlier. Now we work it. Let's say the ball's in here, and we work it from the junction point. So right here, this guy started outside leverage to the right, all right? and he's gonna work the junction point. So the key here is we got our left shoulder on him, our inside shoulder. I got my hands connected on him like we saw in that clip, but they're not extended. If you extend your hands, then you're gonna create separation for him. So now this drill forces you to drop the inside hand, the hand to the side of the release, right? And now I convert to the off arm. From there, I am seeing the belt to low body. Now it's the chop stutter drill, all right? That's the way I see it looking. It's kind of the way you saw it in that clip as well. My eyes are low. I'm seeing the belt to low body. He sinks, I sink, all right? So we call that the junction point chop stutter drill. Here's going to be two guys going at a time, and now they're going to work it with a break. So 17 and this cat are going to convert to off arm. Now he's too high, right? We want to stay low hip, seeing the hip. All right, he sinks, I sink, I match the angle. All right, I wanna match the angle for two steps so I can match the reception point. He knows where he's going, I don't. The big thing we talk about man-to-man, -man, if you see the, the quarterback throw it, you'll see the receiver catch it, right? If you wanna play good man-to-man, -man, you see the ball late, all right? So we gotta match the angle for two steps to work to undercut. So these are kind of low impact drills we do so they don't have to run a ton, but be able to, to work, work what happens. So here we're outside leverage to the left, now we're gonna work the opposite. This is exactly what we saw on the clip with number 36 actually, all right, where he goes opposite my leverage. I gotta to convert to the inside hand, the off hand. And now when he outside releases, I need to see the far hip because he's running away from my post help. I gotta stay on top. Now what everyone's starting to run is that slot fade comeback, right? That's the complement off the slot fade. So we do, we worked out a bunch where I gotta see that far side hip if it chops and drops, I got to be able to open break back down the stem to the receiver, all right? Now, this is dot matrix, all right? So, this is kind of all of it put together, all right? So, we're going to work a scooch to a catch. We got the agile bag two yards behind him because that's realistically as far as you should ever scooch, all right? And then we're going to work a catch. We have cones set for uh, for for uh, the, the slant, the out, we have the dig and we have the inside fade set up for both these guys. And now I'm going to point the receiver where I want him to go and we're going to work the corresponding match. All right. So right here, we're scooching to a catch and we're matching routes now, getting on the appropriate position on the receiver. All right. So this is kind of the whole drill put together. I right, hear some positioning clips. Go ahead, Coach. Coach, uh, can you just uh, say the name of the drill one more time? I call that dot matrix. I don't know why I do it. I think, I don't know. There's just a bunch of cones. So I call it dot matrix. All right, so right here, we're going to look at positioning. So here's 36 again, all right, up here in the top. So you saw him work this junction point drill. You're going to see him carry it over. Now, at this point, he's staying big square in front. This is really what we want, the, you know, and this is what you don't want as a receiver coach, I'm sure, right? He's just going to go and make his move and run himself to the sideline. So we're going to open, and we're going to see the far side hip, and we're going to go ahead and es escort him to the sideline now. All right, and you can see this is a timing throw. They're trying to throw it in a certain spot, and they can't do it because we've impeded the release, disrupted the timing of the route, and we positioned ourselves high hip on the route. And then when we have a little pressure, that always helps as well. All right. Another look at positioning. Okay, here it is going to be on a stack. All right, so we got a little hole player here, so he's still playing outside leverage. All right, I think he's going to scooch this, all right? So he's going to scooch. I think he's a little fast in the scooch right here, if I remember the correction. Yeah, I'd like him to be a little slower in the scooch. All right, but the cat's going to inside release him, so he stays outside low hip, knowing he's got post-safety help. That way he can roll into the seven cut. Now, as a whole, I thought he was a little loose, right? I thought he opened too early. I would like him to collision him, all right? But 
this is a good look of positioning on an inside release of staying outside leverage and letting the seven cut roll into you. Okay, and now here's just a look of the low hold defender and why we can play outside leverage. It's the corner on a dig right here, all right? But we have a low hold defender. It's going to affect the throw, all right? So now we have time to rally and undercut the ball. I'm going to try and speed up a little bit here because I know we're getting close on time. I want to get to some questions. Hey, you're good, Coach. You got time. Uh, there was a question that just came in. Were they playing top hat versus the stack receivers? Um, so right there, they were locked and level. Now, we have the ability to play the stacks basically four different ways. Uh, right there, they were playing locked and level. So the corner showed on the point, took the point, point, and the safety played off. From that same look, we could top hat them and exchange them as well. So uh, we have the ability to do either. To me, it just all determines on what are the route concepts you're getting. And then the other thing is, what's your inside help? You know, I think the way you play stacks in one rat should be different from how you play stacks in five-man rush cover one. Um, now here it is, here's a better job. He's close to the post safety. He's playing catch, great hard shoulder on the receiver. He wants to transition. Now the only thing is stay low hip. See his eyes getting cheated in the backfield right there. Stay low hip and undercut that dig. Great scooch to the catch right here. I mean, this is really it on the slot fade. This is the picture you want. Uh, scooch straight to a catch collision there's the junction point offhand right these are the drills I mean I think these look like the drills we just work that's why we continue to do them because we see the drills show up if you don't see the drills show up no point in doing them so he's converting to his off arm seeing the far side hip it's pretty good all right we get we get the idea on that though I'm gonna kind of move ahead here All right, now let's let's get to the finish, right? Because this is really where the money's made. So last thing we're going to talk about is the finishes. So when we talk about being low hip, low shoulder, here's the receiver, the DB's here, and they're going this way. So this is like a dig. When we're in that position, we talk about a long arm. All right, so we want to secure with the upfield arm, the left arm in this picture, and now we want to use the right arm to throw through the far side wrist to break the ball up, all right? If we're high hip, high shoulder, we talk about raking. So now – uh, let me clear that drawing real quick. I know it's a little hard to see with the yellow, but we'll see pictures here in a second. If I am on top of the route and it's going this way, I rake. I keep my on top leverage and I throw through the far elbow. I'm trying to punch that elbow to stop him from catching the ball. If I'm ever out of phase on a vertical, I play the hands and cap. If I go from in phase to out of phase, I chest to chest. You'll see a picture of that. And then you'll see a chest to chest finish here in a second as well. All right, so here's how we work them. This is low hip, low shoulder, right? Low hip, low shoulder, I'm out of phase. I'm seeing the receiver. I secure with the left arm here, and then I work for the far side wrist with the right arm, all right? So that is, that is the long arm. All right, now here's the rake. I'm on top. You know, this is a zone break, and it could be if you get thrown by in man-to-man, -man, and now I got to recover on the dig, right? So now I'm going to go beat him to a reception point, and I'm going to work to rake the ball out. All right, now one thing that we also talk about, and we'll work this with a pit right here, is anytime the ball's thrown on me and I'm working to break it up, I should always take the receiver to the ground, all right, TTG. Now we don't do it in practice, right, because we're not gonna take our guys to the ground. That's why we're working on a porta pit. But if you study past breakups, and it's really evident when you watch TV copies, a lot of times the ball gets dislodged as they go to the ground, right? Not necessarily from the original contact. So. That's another thing we'll emphasize, especially on the sideline. At every opportunity we have, we're trying to take the receiver to the ground to continue to fight and dislodge the football. All right, but this is an example of a rake when you're high hip, high shoulder. All right, now here should be a chest. Oh, let me go back. Here should be a chest to chest finish um, the way we drill it. So out of phase to in phase, if he gives me his chest, I'm going to give him my chest. And I'm going to go up and through the hand basket to get the ball out. To me, that's also how you want to play the slot fade if the ball is inside the numbers because they have so much room for the back shoulder. This is also how you want to play man in the low red zone and goal line. You want to turn into all routes, make them throw the ball over there. All right, so this is what we call a chest-to-chest -chest finish. All right, these should be some examples of the finishes in games and practice. Uh, so right here, it will be the left safety rotating down on the tight end. He breaks, he's low hip, low shoulder. There's the secure, 
there's the long arm breaking the ball up, right? Again, trying to show the drills happening in the game. All right, this is going to be a chest to chest, all right? So he runs the chop route. His chest comes to me. I'm going to give him my chest. I want to work up and through for the back shoulder. If you look over your inside shoulder here, they're going to complete the back shoulder ball every time, all right? So we want to go chest to chest, play up and through the backhand. This is a really good one, um, I think, if I remember right, right here. All right, scooch, catch. Look at them stay big square in the front. I mean, this is a great, great view of it. All right, you know, it's understanding the route tree, understanding where your help is and what routes you could potentially run, right? If you try and defend every route, you can't do this, right? You got to know what you're doing. Great job converting to the offhand. Look how far he widened the receiver off his stem, gets chest to chest with him, and now he works the punch through the top hand of the hand basket. As the receiver comes down, we want to come up and punch the football out. All right, really good look at it right there. All right, so that's really the uh, the whole progression we use on slot man to man um, from the top, you know. So right now, I could kind of open it up to any questions anybody has. Uh, I can get on this whiteboard or pull film if I have it. Because there was a, a comment in here, um, Coach is wondering if you uh, wants a, a quick contrast to to how the safety is going to play the deep out and quarters to. Uh, quarters technique. Uh, he said he assumes he doesn't catch, but doesn't bail either. Can you just kind of explain that? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can do one better and pull some film up. Is that all right? 